right, hello everyone. Apparently I need to mess with webcams a little bit, but uh, welcome. This is Season 3, Episode 6 of Star Trek Fenrir. For those who are unfamiliar, Fenrir is a tabletop role-playing game that uses the Star Trek Adventures rule set. We are set in the year 2412 aboard a Cerberus class in the Sabine Expanse. You don't need to have watched previous episodes to enjoy this one, but you're probably going to have a richer experience if you do. You'll find the VODs for Fenrir on my YouTube and most of the popular podcast solution. Now, I did want to say one quick thing about um, a recent death in the geek community. Uh, Grant Imahara was a good man, and he was an inspiration to many, and though I did not know him personally, my thoughts are with all that are affected by the sudden loss. What I would say is that please make sure to take care of yourselves and seek out help if you need it, especially given everything that 2020 is throwing at us. But uh, with that said, let's go around and have everyone introduce themselves, starting with Mr. Rast. Hello, uh, I am... John and I play Ras, the half Romulan, half Betazoid first officer of the Fenrir, and I also play Lieutenant Tabby, uh, security officer. All right. Uh, I'm Watney. I play Commodore Brie Archuleta, a human woman, and I also play um, the Denobulan Doctor LL. I'm Dag. I am one of Fenrir's uh, two amazing science officers, the holographic Vulcan Vassar. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter at Shrek Nexus. Hey guys, uh, I am Aaron. I play Commander Williams, the chief of security for Fenrir, and its resident hypochondriac, Lieutenant Jensen. Hello, everyone. I'm Matthew. I play Lieutenant Lee Tobin, a Bajoran science officer, uh, one of two on board the Fenrir. And I also play the security officer, uh, Hydran, Lieutenant Cartwright. Very good. And with that, let's go ahead and run our little intro. Right, and on that note, welcome back. So something I like doing uh, for all my Star Trek games is having the players do an opening log. And today we have a supplemental log from Vassar. So Dag, if you would take it away. Science Officer's Log Supplemental. What began as a simple mission of diplomatic security on Ashgrave 4, colloquially known as Footfall, has quickly escalated into a threat to the entire star system. We expected to secure the colony from vandalism as select members of the colony employed graffiti to invoke end-of-the-world rhetoric. That changed when Commander Chahal reported that demons had been sighted on the world. This revelation spurred an investigation by us into the many purveyors of faith within the colony. We speculated along many lines, and the evidence suggested that these manifestations could be the result of holography used by one sect or another within the intent to spread fear as a prelude to some kind of spiritual domination. The graffiti supported this conjecture. Our investigations led us to the surface where we encountered these demons. Upon observing their behaviors, Commander Rast reached out to communicate with them. 
we learn that there is indeed an entity on or of this world that is subject to the whims of those sentients living upon it. It was then we were notified by Lieutenant Commander Lee aboard Fenrir that a Tholian vessel had been detected and that it had triggered a dangerous solar event. Lieutenant Zero has returned to Fenrir to contribute towards the effort to avert a disaster that could destroy Fenrir, the away team, Ashgrave 4, and every soul on it. Very good. And we're going to resume almost where we left off. Of course, Zero has returned to the Fenrir at this point. But we're going to return to the away team where you all were seeking out the organization known as the Voice of Purity that were responsible for the graffiti incident. And uh, I did want to give you guys a few moments to deal with the information that you got at the end of last session, mainly that, well, there's things going on in orbit. So uh, feel free to take it from there. Uh, so Rast is walking directly towards um, the area where the the voice of purity lie. Okay. Um, he figures as far as the Tholian device and things of that nature, that's, you know, the captain will deal with that shit. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm assuming the rest of you are pretty much following in his wake. Okay. Yeah. Yes. He's, he's the XO. All right, so to set the scene again, uh, you're currently walking through a picturesque vista uh, that is situated between multiple mountainsides. Lots of greens, some purples, some blues, basically the standard Swiss countryside. Um, but as you approach the coordinates that you were given for the Voice of Purity's hideout, what you're seeing is a series of broken buildings. Um, they look to be made of perhaps not quite concrete, made out of some sort of a wood. Um, and what you're noticing is that they're all in states of disrepair. Uh, you're seeing half walls, you're seeing broken down roofs. Um, you're basically seeing that this place has either been struck by something catastrophic or has otherwise been not in use for a significant period of time. And I'm going to give this to you free without even needing to ask. When you plot a tricorder and scan for life signs, you find none in the area. Okay. That's my first thing I was going to say. Hmm. So what extent do we know of what's happening in orbit? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that Lee, Lee Tobin, did tell you that there was something going on in orbit regarding a Tholian device. Um, but how much information, I'm going to leave it up to you guys, how much you've communicated back and forth. Um, I certainly would have, uh, informed, uh, Lieutenant Commander Vassar of the situation and provided him with a data feed from the Fenrir so that he could understand what was going on. Sun go boom, bad. Pretty much. Oh, one crucial detail that I forgot to include was that on the buildings that have walls that are mostly intact, you are seeing that same sort of graffiti that you were originally sent here to deal with. So you're seeing, you know, the end is nigh, or Ragnarok is coming, or, you know, basic doom saying sort of graffiti type things. I think Alel will, like, observe the area with just sight. Mm -hmm. to see if she can find anything since the um, demons didn't show up on any scans. Fair enough. So she'll uh, go around some corners and check it out. Why don't you roll me a insight security difficulty of one? Okay. And I don't know that Alel has a focus. Forensic science? I guess that could apply, actually. <laughs> Hey, two successes, which means you have a floating momentum. So, Alel, as you're moving through the ruins of this sort of pseudo-settlement, um, one thing that you catch catches your attention is, ironically, or maybe not ironically, what you find is a teddy bear, like an intact Earth-style teddy bear. And, you know, it's, you know, standard two arms, two legs, brown fur, 
Uh, it has on basically a Winnie the Pooh sort of accoutrement, um, but it's not Winnie the Pooh. Let's be clear here. We we are not selling out for Winnie the Pooh. Um, <laughs> but what you notice is that in sort of following where this teddy bear may have come from, you notice sort of in the distance there is a cave or the entrance to a cave that was previously sort of hidden uh, beneath the rubble of a, of some of the buildings. Um, she's going to pick up the teddy bear, mm -hmm. turn it over in her hands and then like, uh, look around the, the rubble surrounding them and then find Williams and be like, <gasps> Williams, come here. come here, come here, come here, come here. Okay. Winnie the Q was a great comment. <laughs> oh, <laughs> chat. You may take three momentum for oh, that. Oh, goodness. <laughs> What have you got there, Lieutenant? Look, do you recognize this? She's going to hold it by the ears and like make yeah, it Yeah, I, I, I had one just like it when I was a kid. Just like it? Well, I, I didn't, no, it's, I, I don't mean to say this is the identical bear, but it's a teddy bear. I think every, every Earth child had one of these at one point. Mm. You know, I also read that Earth children were fond of naming these things, so... Um, what was what did you name yours? Theodore. Theodore. What is the purpose of such a device? Comfort. Hmm. She, she's gonna squeeze it. Be it like, squeaks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Um, by the way, I think I saw like something over there, like a cave or something. Well, let's. let's Let's go take a look. Um, in the meantime, GM, can I take my tricorder and perform a scan for LL said cave, um, subterranean power source, um, thermal emissions, anything that would indicate use? I would say I'll give this to you free. Yeah, now that you know where to look as you run your tricorder over the area, you are detecting that there is a subterranean power source. You are detecting that there's actual life signs subterranean. And in fact, there are two such life signs coming up sort of from the earth towards the cave entrance that you have spotted. Well, we've got two heading this way. Commander Rest. Yes, Williams. Two life forms approaching from beneath the surface. Looks like they're going to exit through that aperture. Rast will start walking towards the uh, walking toward the cave entrance. Okay. The Sara will follow. And Williams will too, uh, drawing a phaser. As will Cartwright. Alrighty. Hello will come uh, behind him. So as you get up to the cave entrance to describe it a little bit more, I almost imagine it like an old, like old western style mine where you've kind of got that wooden beam structure that frames the entrance but it's sort of sort sort of collapsed um so you maybe have to move a few things out of the way um but what you notice after you've you know freed up the entrance is that there are indeed uh two humans approaching you uh one a woman uh is wearing a plain white robe and uh, is sort of not gliding across the surface, but, you know, because of how robes obscure the legs, it kind of looks like that. Um, the other individual, a male, uh, is ironically enough, I don't know if ironically again is the right word, but uh, is a Klingon. And, you know, I, I'm just going to throw it out there. Usually Klingon and human mythology doesn't really, you know, mesh together. But, hey, it's a Klingon. Uh, but, of course, they spot you. They sort of wave and stop a respectable distance away. And uh, I guess, Ras, since you're somewhat in the lead there, uh, the woman says, uh, Hello, um, can can we help you with anything? I am uh, Commander Rast of the, Starship, uh, the Federation Starship Fenra. And, uh, well, to put it, to put it bluntly, we're here to try to stop this place from exploding in a few days. The two look at each other and the Klingon sort of shrugs like, oh, and uh, the woman turns back to Rast and says, I'm 
sorry, did I mishear you? The this place is going to explode. Oh yes. Then we were right. Ragnarok is coming. Uh, it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy that you've uh, created here. This planet takes what this planet likes to try to give you what you think you want. And unfortunately, your radicalization of your ideas has really uh, damaged the calm of this planet. Again, the Klingon and the woman look at each other. And the Klingon speaks this time and he says, I find this very hard to believe. We were simply bringing a message of peace, a message of warning. We did not actually mean to cause a catastrophe. What is what is your message? Message the is the world. The end of the world is coming. What kind? What did you think was going to happen? <laughs> well, we thought we would get people to band together to face the trials of the universe together. That's apps. Actually, that's quite perfect. And and there is an opportunity for all of us to fix this by facing these trials together. And the Klingon laughs, but the woman looks a little bit more nervous and says, um, OK, but can you can you tell me more about this whole exploding bit? Like, do I need to move my people out of here to another valley or? Oh, this is, you know, much like you're predicting, this is planet-wide catastrophe. You know, she opens her mouth, holds up a finger, then, you know, sort of closes her mouth and then opens it again and says, okay, that's significantly larger than, again, we intended. Uh, you say we're doing this? Your, your Klingon friend seems to understand a little bit more in the sense that this is our opportunity to find honor and glory in saving this planet from its end. We all must band together and face the trials. And once we've overcome each of these trials, we will avert the end of this planet. And then we can bring this planet back to this peaceful post-apocalyptic um, existence. Why don't you roll me a presence and a command? Difficulty of three. Yeah, look. Hey, look at those uh, nice little. Uh... Oh, look, we're down three momentum now. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll get it right back. Uh, and you said what? Uh, presence Sorry. command. All right. Oh, yeah. I have augmented presence. Rolling four dice and persuasion as a focus. Oh yeah, I think I've got a focus. Okay, <clears throat> there we go. Nice. Yeah, you get all that momentum right back. Uh, actually, I think let's see here. That's five, six with your augment. So yeah, you actually not only get it back, but you cap on momentum again. So yeah, the uh... and, and Winnie the Q wanted to give us his three momentum anyway. Nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, so we'll say for sake of argument, you have uh, two floating, so you could do something with that. Um, but yeah, the uh, the woman uh, sort of, you know, looks a little bit paler as all this information is sinking in. And she eventually sort of reaches, you know, slowly, not like fast, but she you know, slowly reaches to her belt, uh, picks out a communicator, you know, flips it open and says... Uh, folks, uh, you're gonna want to come meet me at uh, the meeting place in about five minutes. And then she flicks it closed and puts it back on her belt and says, I will gather my people and tell them that we need to begin. Honestly, I'm not sure what to tell them at this point. Um, what is it you'd like us to do? We need to do is we need to look at the look at any of the texts that we can find and find out what the trials and 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 tests are that we as a community have to band together to overcome to prevent this armageddon this apocalypse 
And you just uh, need to stop sowing dissent. Well, we we can certainly do that, pointing at Williams. But uh, then again, the woman hesitates again, and the Klingon comes in and says, Well, we're going to need lots of pain sticks, from what I remember of our mythology. Lots and lots of pain sticks. And the woman sort of looks at the Klingon and says, No, we're not doing that again. No. But uh, yes, I will gather my people, and we will discuss, I guess, de-escalating our message, but... Uh, honestly, we haven't done anything of the sort in a week's time. But your message in itself is one of, you know, the end is coming. Um, most doomsday uh, prophecies do come with a morality lesson of sorts, something that you're trying to uh, give to those people, hope, giving them hope at the last minute to turn around the direction of the end does your does your belief not have such a thing she bites her lip for a moment just sort of thinking to herself and finally says i guess the message would be that we want ashgrave 4 to be less of a federation run colony and more of a spiritual retreat it sort of is that already but we can't construct churches to specific faiths we can't really visit the planet except by quote-unquote reservation we would like to change these things again that was our original message to bring people together but i i Based on what you've told me, I, I feel like this is something beyond us at this point. The, the will the will and the consciousness of the people as a whole are the ones that have kind of made your message carry a little bit more weight. Uh, you have a lot more influence than you possibly think. And what we need to do is we need to work with everyone to change that narrative right right um well you're welcome to join me at the meeting um there's only about 15 of us in total uh i'm basically just going to tell them what you've told me um i know some are a little bit nervous around uniform types but uh again you are welcome uh are the, you said they're coming here uh, there's a amphitheater a little bit further into the cave that we'll be meeting. All right. Uh, we'll be, we'll be down in a few moments. Very good. Very good. Come Kotar and, uh, Kotar, uh, sort of laughs a little bit heartily and falls in the woman's wake. Um, as she is leaving though, I did want to give Lee an opportunity. Uh, Lee at this point, uh, I would say you have basically gotten all that information I gave you privately. And I wanted to give you a moment to confer not only with the away team, but with people uh, back on the Fenrir. Okay. Uh, before we switch over to Lee, could I just ask a question from Cartwright's perspective? Sure. The name that, of the Klingon, is that the same Klingon that was referenced by Commander Chahal, or is it a different Klingon? Uh, it's a different Klingon. It's it different. is a different Klingon, yes. Okay. I wrote their names down. You're on the ball deck. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, oh, well, Captain, uh, Lee is going to turn around in his science chair or his uh, science station and uh, look at the Captain. Well, Captain, uh, it seems as if, well, this entire situation is just damnably strange. I'm detecting no chronometric readings that have suggested that this Tholian weapon or probe was actually transmitted through time, even though it reads as having derived from the 29th century. Um, Tholians as a species, although they are reclusive and xenophobic, tend away from time travel. They have a number of apparent cultural hangups about the entire process. So I'm not entirely sure that they would use this uh, approach. And the timing of it just seems too coincidental. From what we know from the away team, we have been informed that this bizarre 
Ragnarok scenario is supposed to take place in two days and suddenly the sun is going to go Nova in two days, it seems a little bit too, well, convenient. And I don't particularly trust coincidences. Uh, do you have reason to believe that the sun is giving off a false reading to make us perceive that there's going to be a problem? Well, can I do some kind of insight science test to see if uh, I can analyze the data to, to determine the, the nature of this incident? Is it uh, some kind of deception or? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, let's do an insight science. I will give the Fenrir an assist with computers in science. Okay, I'll do that. But I will make this a difficulty of five. <laughs> and there is a reason for that. I'm not just throwing high difficulty at you for the sake of high difficulty. There is a reason for this. Did you say sensors, science? Uh, computer science. Computer science. Okay. Um, and one of the things I'd like to look for is whether or not there is any correlation between what limited sensor readings have been fed to the Fenrir from the away team with respect to their analysis of the manifestations of the planet um, and see if there's any correlation between that and what's going on with the sun. Alrighty. Uh, so could I focus on that data and review it briefly using mental repository to... Yeah, you can do your combo. Okay. So that is insight science. Mm -hmm. And I would like to... I'd like to buy... Would anyone mind if I bought three dice for that? Do it. Okay, I'll give so... you determination too. Uh, so sensor operations or I'll give you sensor operations in this context. Yeah. Okay. Applicable focus. Interesting. Wow. Uh, so I would like to use determination to reroll those two zeros. Okay. And give me a moment while I try to figure out an applicable value. Um, I'm going to say, could I tap prop, the prophets gave us this world to explore in the sense that I am questing after the truth and I want to uncover the nature of this, uh, this crisis because there is a, a, a religious significance to it. So I'm also appealing to my sense of faith regarding the prophets that their desire for us to find the truth. Yeah, I think that's pretty solid. Okay. So. You are technically at five successes already. Uh, no, because I didn't tap determination originally. I'm at three successes. Uh, Archuleta gave you determination. Mm. Right. So you're using, I think what's happening is there was a, there was an order of operations error. The Commodore gave Lee her determination, but he didn't spend it initially, oh, okay. but he is spending it now uh, is what's happening. Hey, would you look at that? I believe that is four, six successes. So you get one momentum back. And by my count, you should be at one total momentum. So, Lee, you're on the right track. And the more you look at the sensor data, the more you realize is that this is, this is a fabrication. Like, this is... Something is more at play here. And the reason for the high difficulty is that as you're running the data through the computer, there's almost like a small lockout window where you're typing and then the screen sort of locks out for a moment. And then it displays a sort of a symbol that you would have come to know as Maddox symbol, as in your old friend Maddox. Uh, and it simply says, Captain's eyes only on it. Need to understand what Williams dislikes in that man. Captain, I'm afraid that we may have encountered something that has been left behind by our former chief engineer. There's some kind of gunk oh, in the programming. Oh, okay. Um, just uh, send it to my the captain's chair. Aye, sir. And I will forward that message or the sensor data to Captain Archuleta. All right. So, Archuleta, you look at your little armrest on your computer or on your uh, captain's chair, 
And what you're seeing is a bunch of scientific data that goes way over your head, even with your training in science. Uh, but there is an attached audio message that, again, says captain's ears only. Uh, so she, <laughs> she's going to forward it to her ready room and go take it in there. All right. So uh, as you step into the ready room, uh, what you find is that waiting for you okay. is not Q, but something else entirely. So tell me, I don't think we've ever really discussed this in the context of Archuleta. Uh, is Archuleta a spiritual person? I believe we talked a little bit off stream about it, but I don't think we've done it on stream. Yes. Um, individualistically, not so much dogma involved okay would you say there's a particular a particular ritual or something that she does to observe her form of faith um she would she would meditate in a vulcan way because her okay. mentor was so like there. incense burning and things of that nature yes Mm -hmm. All right. So what you do see as you walk into your ready room is that there is a copious amount of incense burning on all surfaces. <laughs> and you definitely didn't put those there. Uh, just going to like look around to see if anybody's there. And then, well, Williams is on the on the away team. Yeah, on the away team. Uh, Don't look at me. Tavi. Can I call Tavi? You Tavi? certainly call Tavi. Okay. <laughs> um, just gonna tap her badge and be like, uh, security, there's some kind of incense burning in my ready room. I definitely didn't put it here. You're muted, Rast. Tavi will get there as quickly as possible. All right. So she uh, she won't be like unfortunately frantic. Tommy's put away right now. <laughs> yeah, so she won't be like frantic about it, but she just wanted to inform them that something was going on. Mm -hmm. Oh, he comes he comes in like she she was like screaming for help. You know, he like bursts in. He's got he's got his uh, phaser out, looking around the room. <laughs> he kind of does like a little roll when he comes in. Oh. um... That was fast. Oh yeah, you know you gotta you gotta come to the captain's aid pretty quickly. So uh, yeah, what uh, what's uh, what's going on? He's looking around. Um. Well, I'm not entirely sure yet. Um. But I wanted oh. you to be informed that something was amiss. It smells like a head shop in here. A what? Oh, nothing. It's just some places that I saw in New York. Oh, okay. On Earth. Uh, I feel embarrassed as a human. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, I'll, I'll go ahead and dismiss you, but I just want to keep, keep an eye out on the bridge for anything. Uh, uh, all right. I'll, I'll be right outside the door. Thank you. All right. If you need anything, just, uh, you know, whistle. You know how to whistle, right? And he uh, he exits the room. She will uh, like try to whistle as she like opens the audio. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so initially, I was gonna have uh, James do that, but uh, since he isn't here, I'm just gonna paraphrase for him. So the message is actually one of those things where you know Matic was a very composed individual, doesn't really get flustered. But uh, this is definitely a panicking Matic voice. Like, this is a everything's gone to shit. You know, this this is Matic panicking. And uh, the message says the following. Captain, Commodore, whatever the hell rank you are, if what the computer and the sensors just picked up is true, you need to get your crew, you need to put them on the ship, you need to fly the fuck away from here and blow up whatever you were just scanning. And that's all the message says. Wow, I really wish this wasn't a one-way thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, 
so um she'll open uh she'll open the doors again and then turn a fan on to get the meditate meditative stuff like out mm-hmm. of the air because she's not in the mood and uh she'll tap her badge and try to get a hold of rast yeah you do get a hold of rast uh commander this is the captain report well we've uh made contact with the entity here um that has told us about ragnarok we have uh, also met with the leaders of the voice of purity and uh we're about to have a meeting with them on where we can possibly discuss ways to prevent the end of the world um did lee tell her anything about it being fake or Uh, weird no he just got the data that he couldn't really interpret and then it was blocked out i think by madison oh okay so so he was like suspecting that something was wrong or a false reading or something okay Mm -hmm. yep um Is, are, uh, can anyone else hear me? Um, Rest. He, he steps away. Okay. Uh, not any longer. I just got a, a message, and you'll never guess who it's from. Uh, we left him in Andromeda. Oh, Mr. Matic. He was vehemently warning me. This was my eyes only, by the way. Um, He sounded more frantic than I think I've ever heard him. And he was vehemently warning me to uh, basically abandon the mission as quickly as possible. Are you picking up any sort of emotional oddities going on on the surface? Um, Don't reach out again and try to get a general sense. Okay. Uh, I believe this would be probably another insight and command, I think, is what we've been doing in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we do. do we, I, I found it in my notes. So, yeah, you're going to do an insight command uh, difficulty of three this time. We'll use that one momentum we have. Okay. Hey, look at that. And you get the three you need. So, Again, Ras, before when you sort of reached out with your mind, you were hearing what is basically children clamoring for your attention, like lots of voices talking over one another, not really able to get a sense for what's going on. However, this time when you reach out, that din has lessened. You're beginning to pick out individual voices. Like, it's still hard to pick out, like, a specific voice, but every once in a while you'll get, like, a little bit of a snippet. And the snippets you're getting are not great, to say the least. They are very much a apocalyptic sort of mindset, which is probably what you were expecting. Uh, you're hearing things such as, I knew it, or the end is coming, or why did I leave them behind? And then, I'm going to spend threat to do this, as you're processing all this, the din stops. And a very powerful voice, which I'm not even going to try to do a voice for, uh, very deep, very masculine, almost demonic, uh, speaks and says, who are you? I am Commander Rast of the Federation Starship Fenrir. Oh, so that's where you were hiding, Fenrir. Well, I will be eating you soon. And then... uh, Sort of to set the scene, where is Rast in relation to the away team right now? Uh, just about uh, 10 yards away. Okay. So all of you on the away team watch as Rast. It's like someone has literally like punched Rast, sucker punched him in the face. And Rast, you sort of reel from this psychic feedback. And, mm-hmm. you know, you catch yourself before you like fall over. But the sheer amount of psychic potential that just came through your telepathic link is overwhelming. And I need you to take two stress of damage, please. Whoa. Okay. Um, So, Captain, um, 
Yeah, there's yeah. definitely something here. <laughs> uh, it just, well, for lack of a better, better term, psychically assaulted me. Are you hurt? Um, I'll be fine. Um, I've never actually encountered something like that. But there seems to be some sort of malevolent entity here. Maybe it is actually the cause of what this issue might be. I started hearing some of the voices a little bit more clearly. Before, it was just like listening to school children. But I started hearing a few of the voices, you know, starting to say the end is here. And then he said he was going to eat the Fenrir. Uh, okay. Have you made friends with the locals yet? Um, you know, I'm just like I said, I was going in to speak with, meet with the voice of purity here in just a few moments. All right. Um, ask them what the hell's going on. We'll continue to uh, observe from orbit. I think there's, I think there's a potential that somebody brought or woke something to this, uh, brought something to this planet or woke something up that was resident here. And the, the, the being that assaulted you didn't identify itself. Oh no. Um, just, a very deep, um, frightening voice. All right. Well, continue on and be careful. Yes, sir. Rest out. So Commodore, as that communication ends, before we go back to the away team, you look back at your computer and the data from Matic is still displaying, and you catch two important bits of info. You see the words Dr. Bert Ruger and Psy Outpost. That's all you see is those two, two words. Now, that's going to mean something to people who have watched Ophion and Arcadia, but for the rest of you, this is a whole surprise. Uh, but we are going to cut back to the away team at this point. And uh, I'm assuming that you all are staying together as you basically go further into the cave network to meet with the Voice of Purity. So uh, you step into an amphitheater that's maybe about the size, uh, let's say, 20 meters by 30 meters. Uh, it's a fairly compact space, all things considered. Uh, but you are seeing all members, all 15 members of the Voice of Purity there. Uh, all of them are human, except for your, well, one token Klingon. And uh, they're all wearing the same sort of white robe that their leader was wearing. And the leader uh, sort of steps up on sort of this raised platform of wood that they have built in the space. And sort of motions for everyone to calm down and says, All right, everyone, um, thank you for coming on such short notice. Uh, as you can see, we are... Uh, blessed with Starfleet's presence today. Uh, they have brought us ill tidings that we are perhaps responsible for an actual doomsday scenario. Um, does anyone know anything? Does anyone know of... Um, uh, and she sort of looks at, at you, Rast, uh, looking, you know, asking what should she be asking at this point. So... Um... Rast is going to lean over to LL and uh, uh, just be ready in case that happens again. And he rubs his temples. Um, so can and, she and probably wipes a little bit of blood from his nose? So mm -hmm. has he? He's taken like damage. Yes, and I assume can be healed. Um, not this stress damage. He does have two off his stress track, though. Yes. Okay. She's like, I'm ready. And then he, uh, he'll go over there and, uh, has anyone, uh, this is going to sound strange. And unfortunately he thinks to himself, uh, he's going to have to reach out 
uh, and try to sense their emotions as he asks the question. Mm -hmm. um, but he's going to ask, has anybody heard voices? Let's see what to make this as a roll. Why don't you do another presence command? The difficulty will be a three. And we'll make the complication range a 17 to 20. Okay. Let me see here. And you know what? I'm going to spend my, my determination. Okay. And uh, we're going to use, uh, there's no such thing as the unknown. Okay. Uh, so presence command, two dice. Uh, oh. Hey, so that's, that's uh, four, four successes. Five total. Five, because you're right, because you have augmented presence. So yeah, you get two momentum. So the good news, Ras, is when you reach out with your mind to feel their emotions as you ask this question, you don't sense that overwhelming force that uh, assaulted you earlier. Uh, but what you're getting is a general sense of unease, uh, a general sense of fear, uh, not specifically at you, but a fear as in eh, sort of like they're starting to believe their own dogma, I guess would be a way to put it. Um, and, you know, a few people speak up like, yeah, I've I've thought I heard something or, yeah, I, I once conversed with a, a being, but nothing concrete, like nothing like, oh, yeah, you know, I carried on a conversation with so-and-so kind of a thing. There is... I do want to stress that there is, uh, and uh, Williams, you're supposed to be doing the momentum. I'm, I'm disappointed in you, man. Oh, sorry, bud. <laughs> hey, he puts up his hands and he's, there's nothing to fear. This is something that can be prevented. It's just, we all have to work together. And as you say this, Rast, uh, you all suddenly feel the ground underneath of you shift as if in an earthquake. And up on the, up on the Fenrir, uh, Lee, you're detecting that the mountain range at the away team's location has suddenly started to grow in pressure and tectonic stress. Uh, to compare, this is the same level as Mount St. Helens, if you're familiar oh with that. Oh, no. Lieutenant Lee to the away team, I need you to get out of that cave system immediately. We're going to be transporting you back to the Fenrir along with anyone that you can get out of there. You need to evacuate immediately. We are detecting, well, immense geological and tectonic instability in the area. Understood. Okay, starts running. <laughs> uh, everyone, uh, please come with me. <laughs> please exit the cave in an orderly fashion. Unless it's please. fake. Unless it's fake. One way to find out. As an experiment, I propose we return to Fenrir to see if the instability continues or <laughs> if it dies down. Oh, I live a little bit. Sorry. Rast is surely <laughs> thinking of staying. <laughs> All right. Lee to Captain Archuleta, could you please report to the bridge um, and order the commander to return to the ship immediately? The of course. Of grave danger. Um, Rast, what are you doing? Beam them up, Zeke. We're we're all exiting the cave so that you can get a lock on us. Is the shakiness just being threatening? Has it increased or decreased? It is it increasing. Are there, uh, with the tricorder, are there um, related uh, thermal emissions and such? Such pressure would be building up with temperature and heat. So these caves would be getting pretty warm. Yeah, I would say that by the time you guys get out of the cave, you actually would look back behind you and you're seeing almost like a red crimson glow. And the ruins on the surface? Uh, they are falling apart as the earth is shaking. How many total do we have here? 20? Uh, with the away team, yes, 20 total. 
Want you to beam up, please. <laughs> I got a lock on you. I can get you on the cargo transporter. You'll be in Cargo Bay 4. All right. So, uh, as the away team beams away, I think I've got a map for this somewhere. Uh, yes, I do. We'll just have to use the title card for uh, display purposes. But uh, as you beam up and uh, Commodore and Lee, as you're looking on the bridge at the view screen of the planet, uh, what you're seeing is that in sort of this lower area over here, uh, let me actually ping so people can see. So over here uh, on the southern sort of side of the planet, uh, what you're seeing is that reddish glow uh, begins to consume and otherwise sort of warp the mountain range where the away team was just. And to your amazement, uh, what happens is not an explosion like at Mount St. Helens, but it's almost as if the mountains themselves are lifting up out of their earthly bonds and forming into a shape. And that shape is that of a giant, absolutely gigantic, um, fiery being, vaguely humanoid in shape, and it is wielding uh, this great fiery sword. And I don't think I need to say this, but I think Lee would make the connection at this point. If Ragnarok is what's supposed to happen, this would be Sutir, the king of Muspelheim, and the one that brings about Ragnarok. Wow. See something new every day, uh, Commodore. Yes. Do we want to lob some quantum torpedoes at that, or <laughs> I'm guessing that's the one, the guy that said he was gonna eat us. So uh, should we try and hail it first? <laughs> Hail um, the god of fire. Demon, but yes. The okay. demon of fire. I, I think that would be more appropriate, yes. Uh, all right, Captain. I'm not sure if it has any means of receiving hails, considering it's a biological life form, perhaps, but I will try to open communication frequencies with the demon that brings about the end of the world. Yeah, and also Rass reports the bridge, because we'll need you if this doesn't work. And uh, Rast is going towards the bridge, but hearing that we're going to be trying to open communication, he is going to do his best to open his own communication to the voice. Ooh, fun. So, uh, Commodore, as you get and an open... Takes, and he takes LL with him. Takes LL with you. All right. <laughs> so let's set the scene on the bridge here, because this is going to matter. All right. So, Williams, you're coming along. Vasara, you're coming along. So you guys walk in. And then Rast, you're walking in. And then where did I put Alel? There she is. All right. So, yeah, hey, maybe we can get Watney to talk to herself. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so Rast, as you open out your mind at the same time as the Commodore begins, uh, you know, addressing Sutir... Um, something happens, Ras, and I am spending threat to do this. Um, you find yourself almost as a sudden mouthpiece for this malevolent entity. Like, there is no resistance. You are almost like the force that hits you is almost like a tsunami. Like, you're sitting on the beach and a tsunami slams into you <laughs> and temporarily takes over your body. And I'm going to speak for you in this instance. Uh, so Commodore, you're saying something to the effect of, hey, attention, entity, mm -hmm. so-and-so, mm -hmm. uh, when from Rast, you hear a completely different voice than his normal. And as you look at Rast, wondering what the hell's going on, you see that his eyes are glowing red and Rast says, I told you I would be eating you, Fenrir. We've been over this. And that's where we're uh. going to take our break. Oh my so we will be back in 10 minutes, everybody. Stick around.
we can change our backgrounds. Yup. All right, oh, and welcome point. back, everybody. Uh, so this is uh, part two of session six, where uh, apparently Ragnarok is actually happening, complete with uh, Sutir and fiery possession and all sorts of fun time. So we resume our episode uh, on the bridge of the Fenrir, where Rast has been more or less um, taken over by uh, presumably Sutir. And with red glowing eyes, uh, maybe even his tips of his fingers are glowing red, maybe even sparking a little bit. And uh, Williams has done the uh, security officer thing where he gets between the Commodore and Rast. And uh, Rast, I need you to roll me a control and a security, please. Difficulty of two. And I will give you one threat to roll three dice, please. Nice. I forget when players use threat. Um, do I have a focus? <laughs> you do have a focus, yes. Okay. Had to ask, sorry. Yeah, so uh, I get a threat for that. And uh, yeah, Williams, you saw this coming. Uh, as you start to move towards Rast, Rast sort of puts out his hand, and typical war fashion, you go flying across the bridge over a console, and, uh, you know... Uh, Rask, give me your give me your best evil laugh if you would. <laughs> there you go. And uh, Williams, is you're over Foolish here now. Mortal. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, you know, and as I take back Rast over for a moment, so Rast sort of laughs and says, "I told you I would eat you. Now we can do this one of two ways: either I can come to you, or you can come to me." Um, how about, uh, <laughs> why don't you come up here? With pleasure. And Rast, you reel back again as the presence leaves you. You're complete control of your, fac your faculties again. However, on the view screen, as we cut back to the, sort of that external display, uh, on the view screen... What you're seeing is that fire giant Sutir is growing larger and larger and larger. Not just approaching you, but in general is getting to be... I, I hate to use, use the word gigantic again, but yeah, he is absolutely massive at this point. Uh, so Bree's going to... to check in with the transporter team and see how many people that we can evacuate as we're drawing his attention. Okay. Uh, Zeke, why don't you give me a insight engineering difficulty of one? Dag, you're muted, by the way. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm getting Zeke. Uh, hold up. Insight Engineering? Yep. Okay. Um, Transporter Foo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, anybody mind if I borrow a momentum? Oh. Uh, it's one momentum for three dice. Correct. Yeah. This is for all the marbles. Hey, two successes. You get the momentum right back. Probably 20 minutes, you think, to get everybody up off the planet. But in mechanical terms, that would be four rounds. All right, I can do it, but it's going to take about 20 minutes. We got about 2,000 people to evacuate. I'm torn between just duking it out and getting farther away because the farther away we get, the harder it will be to transport. Uh, of course, we could just leave them on there at well, this point. What if we did both? <sighs> transport has got to rain. Sorry. If we separated the ship off in beta sections, drew him off, 
or it, while Gamma began the evacuation. There's also the possibility, Captain, that we might not be able to defeat it. If this is the psychic manifestation of the colonists' belief, or some other quasi-supernatural phenomenon, there may be no way for us to defeat it using conventional means. My earlier joke about a quantum torpedo volley aside. I almost wonder if when we take the uh, colonists off the planet, if it will no longer exist. Can we run a sensor scan on the creature knowing what we do of the sun and the way in which that seemed to be some form of illusion correlating the data between the two? Yeah. Uh, why don't, uh, Lee, why don't you roll me a reason and a science? And difficulty on this would just be a one. Okay. Is it possible to have external hologram? Yeah, you could, to a certain degree, you could have an external hologram. Um, Vassar, what would it take to project an external hologram of a period accurate warrior attacking him with a sword? Depending on the rendering desired, it would take between 45 seconds and 12 minutes. Anything that can be done quickly with your with your expertise and I, ll do you have any juice with you you're not doing that no I, why because it's a, dangerous it, it, it it's dangerous for all the people on that planet as well you could literally die if you do this don't die. She's going to ignore him and go help Williams. Okay. Quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, testing a theory and theory into practice, would those apply? Both would apply. So difficulty zero then? Mm hmm. Or, okay. Basically free momentum for you. So I will be, uh, I will be attempting this without the, uh, without the juice then. Okay. <laughs> As I wait for Vassar's uh, illusion. Is the ship uh, uh, assisting Lee's sensor roll? No, this is purely him connecting the dots. Okay. But uh, hey, three momentum for you guys, so that's four momentum. So Lee, yeah, the whole sun situation, same thing going on with Sutir here. Almost to the point that you're starting to wonder... What's, you know, this is beyond, you know, simple coincidence at this point. There is something going on here that you're just not quite getting at first. And then, you know, you sort of look through what you can of the Matic data and you see the word Psy Outpost, same as the captain saw. And you maybe think, all right, well, what's the Psy Outpost thing? And you pull up Psy Outpost and... Again, it's a Matic record, so it's all over the place. But what you're seeing is that apparently uh, the Arcadia, Matic's first ship, is that they encountered a phenomenon where everything that the crew and everything of every being involved in that area thought of became reality. Captain, uh, correlating this data with information provided to us by Commander Maddox records, although they are a mess and it's probably for the best that he's no longer in Starfleet. Um, <laughs> it seems as if we might be dealing with a situation similar to something that he encountered in the past. Every single person, perhaps on the colony and on the ship, is manifesting their thoughts. Now, oh, we are, this, are we? Yes. Okay. What's the reason? And how do we stop it? <laughs> Hell if I know. Yeah, I was to say the records uh, basically say that they beamed everyone they could off and got the hell out of there. It's almost this old saying my parents used to say, if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one around, doesn't make a sound. 
I don't see how that applies in any way, Captain, but uh, all right. Uh, well, if we're not around to believe in whatever this is, would it exist? Ah. Humans have interesting metaphors. Okay. I would suggest, Captain, that your plan has merit. If we can distract it temporarily and separate the ship, as Commander Williams suggested, we might be able to hold it off until we can beam the colonists off and then, well, follow Maddox's suggestion and just yeah. get out of here. Yeah, let's do it. All right, so let's go to our uh, space battles map for this one as I clean up here. Uh, so if I understand your intentions correctly, you want to be beaming people off of the planet while in multi-vector assault mode. And you are also distracting it with one of the sections of the Fenrir. Yes. Okay. Nothing complicated at all. Yeah, nothing complicated at all. <laughs> All right, uh, I don't have a planet ready, but let's say that uh, this circle here that I'll draw in orange, that's the actual planet itself. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, not to scale. Uh, but uh, what you're seeing is that, again, Sutir is ra rather massive compared to the planet at this point. Um, uh, one thing I would ask, though, is I need to know which section or which sections are doing the beaming. Because in order to do the beaming, you have to have your shields down. Typically, Zeke sits in Gamma section. Okay. And this seems like there was a low preparation for this effort. So um, when we think about the amount of people we'll, we're going to need to be moving, I think we should consider uh, the cargo, the section with cargo. That would be Gamma and Beta. Yeah. So Gamma and Beta are doing the heavy lifting and we're doing the running again. Zoomies. Yeah. Also, hi, Kitty. We see you. Yeah, she's... <laughs> Clingy tonight. Oh. All right. So uh, I'm going to let you guys get your first turn here. Uh, as I said, this is going to require four rounds that you have to survive to get everyone off the planet. Uh, so what is your first turn going to be? And let's just have every section of the Fenrir act at once uh, rather than giving them each individual turns. The star will turn to Commander Rast. Commander, I have prepared a render if you still wish to pursue that course of action. Yes, please. All right. Uh, have the hologram um, move forward with the ship and swing its sword at him. Okay. Have as many have as many people in the have as many people in the that are currently beamed up in the cargo bay see the warrior image fighting the suitor image. So Visar will activate a telescreen in the cargo bay and mm -hmm. he'll turn to Commander Williams. Commander Williams, in order to successfully execute this maneuver, I will need all structural integrity to the forward shields. I uh, hope this works. There we go. Got you a quick <laughs> ice giant image. Because why not? All right. So uh, in order to pull this off, Williams, uh, this is going to be a modulate shields task for you. As I find it in the new rule book, because the Klingon rule book updated things. Ooh. Uh, looks like it's the same. All right. So that's going to be a... Structure, or no, for you, it's a control security, and the structure or the ship will assist you with structure engineering. Uh, the difficulty here is two, and the power requirement is one. Okay, um, I will take a point of momentum for an extra d20. Okay, um, I will also use my augmented, uh, augmented control. And all right. And would shipboard tactical systems apply here? Most definitely. Wow. 
That is uh, six successes, which means you get four momentum, which means you have one floating. Uh, you could actually spend that one floating to increase your total resistance by two. Well, let's do that. Alrighty. So you shunt power for the alpha section of Fenrir into structural integrity. And Rast, I'm, if I understand where you're going with this, you're basically projecting your psychic potential as an opposing force to Sutir? Yes, and displaying it to all of the people in the cargo bay to try to make it so that they can manifest like hope beyond, you know, because here's this warrior that's come to defeat the fire giant. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Uh, why don't you roll me a presence command difficulty of four? And if you are successful, I will say you land an attack on Sutir. Okay. Presence command, and I'll use three momentum. Okay. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> No. So I'm well, gonna well, I'm gonna challenge a value. Okay. Um, every problem has a solution. Okay. And I'll uh, I'll fix that later, and I'll reroll. Wow, that was awful. Yeah, that was uh, that was a thing. Let's try that again. That's better. That's better. Yeah, that's, that's four five. successes. Five successes. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, the holographic ice giant, quote unquote, that we're, you know, basically doing a psychic gestalt of, uh, the ice giant comes down with a, uh, we'll say an axe just for thematic sake, comes down with an icy axe and clangs against Sudir's sword. And, you know, there's kind of a cheer in the cargo bay from the people that are watching this. Um, but as that's going on, uh, Gamma and Beta... I need to know, obviously, Zeke's got a gamma section, but who would be doing the beaming in beta section? Lee has transporters and, re and uh, replicators and an engineering of four, so that's a possibility. Is there another transporter chief? I don't think so. Lee's the man. All right, so let's say that beta and gamma, you guys get sort of around either side of suit here and begin beaming up. Uh, so both Zeke and Lee, I need you, and this is two separate roles. You each are doing your own role here, but it's the same role. Uh, you're both going to be doing a control engineering. The difficulty will be a three, uh, but the ship is assisting you with sensors engineering, so the difficulty becomes a two. Should we both take uh, three momentum each, or...? Uh, I think if that is the ultimate goal, that would be good, yes. Then three momentum grants us... Two additional two dice, so dice four total. Each. And Aaron, would you be willing to roll for gamma section for me? <laughs> Transporter foo, here we go. All right, so that's three for Lee. Actually, doesn't Lee have augmented control? Uh, augmented reason. Reason, that's what it is. All right, so three for Lee, uh, three for Zeke, and, and then yeah. Sorry, I need... What is the what's the ship rolling? Sensors engineering. Okay. That's gamma section. Does anybody have beta section? No, I mean it's the same one. Okay. Yeah, really, the uh, only thing that changes from beta to, to between the sections of the ship is uh, power, really. Power and shields. But yeah, uh, go ahead and roll gamma section or beta section one more time. Okay. Ooh. Ooh, okay, so that's going to be Zeke is going to get the complication. So you get two momentum total. And you are able to beam up a sizable portion of the population. However, Zeke, there's a problem with the transporter buffers. Uh, you are, of course, redlining all the buffers, both in the cargo bays and in transporter rooms in Gamma section. And the complication is that the cargo transporters go down. Now, you can fix it, but it's going to take time. 
I can do this. I'm a transporter chief, not a doctor. <laughs> oh, Lord. All right, so that is your guys' turn. Now, Sutir is going to attack the Ice Giant, uh, but he's really attacking the Fenrir. And I'm going to say, based on Sutir's sheer size... And basically the fact that at the moment he is kind of being seen as, you know, a manifestation of evil, if we want to flavor it that way. Uh, I'm going to say that he automatically hits you, but there is going to be... I'm still going to roll for damage, obviously. So I'm going to give him... Let's give him this mini die. And let's see what happens. I like how this mini is a number. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's see what we have here. All right. So the Fenrir, you guys do have a blade of armor, correct? Uh, yes, we've got a blade of armor. And um, with the floating momentum from the initial roll, we also have increased resistance. Right. So you would have plus four total. So the Fenrir would have seven resistance. Which is good. So you're actually going to take only four damage uh, to your shields as Sutir comes uh, across with the swipe of his sword and spikes into the side of the ice giant and grazes the Fenrir's shields with his massive weapon. Uh, not enough to cause a breach, thankfully, but uh, you definitely probably don't want to take another one of those if you can help it. Damage to anybody with a neural interface? Uh, let me double check neural interface. Does it say when you breach or any time the ship takes damage? That's what I'm trying to find real quickly here. I think it is a breach. Yeah, because if it's a breach, then you're fine. Let's see. It would be under medicine, maybe? No, of course it's not under medicine. Why would it be under medicine? That would make too much sense. And for sake of argument, let's just say it's a breach. So, yeah, the, the ship did not suffer a breach, so you're fine. Um, but yeah, it is now the player's turn again. What would you guys like to do? <clears throat> what percentage are shields holding need? up? Yeah, great question. Uh, I would say you guys are at, quick math, you're at two-thirds shields. So it's four turns to get them all off. Correct. We just went through one. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> shields are down to 66%. A little. <laughs> okay, we're doing great. Um, just going to check in with Zeke. How is the transporting coming? So you're going to hear a lot of like sharp electro crack electrical crackling and 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 zaps as zeke is like i, I got it i i got it i i just need to re replug in the heisenberg compensators into the grid flux uh and it's it's gonna be fine don't worry about it zap ow <laughs> zeke we need to get them off of that planet now I know. Uh, I overloaded the buffer. Uh, it's it's uh, two seconds. Two s ow. Uh, sorry. Hey Zeke, I'm gonna spend two threat. Your raptor friend has decided to visit you, and she's not <laughs> helping you at all. And I can't transport her away. <laughs> mm-hmm. Is there a replicator in this transporter room? Yeah, there would be. Computer, replicate uh, raw roast beef shank uh, Zeke meal five. And the computer errors out for a moment and says, unavailable power. <laughs> Don't divert power from the shields to do this. He's well, he's on gamma. Focus. So. Oh, yeah. okay. You might want to then. <laughs> um, Zeke's going to use intimidation to uh, cow Yvette uh, at least long enough to be able to get this power grid back online and get the, the transporters running again. All right, let's do you first then. Uh, give me a presence in engineering 
a difficulty of three. And this is an activation for Zeke, so you can't actually give him another focus. You could give him a talent. Uh, you could also raise one of his disciplines or one of his attributes. Um, what are the two stats for this? Uh, presence and engineering. Uh, let's make his... Uh, what's the maximum engineering can be? Uh, maximum engineering can be five. Okay, so let's make his engineering a five. Okay. So uh, does that be plus one in the dice? Or... No, you literally change uh, his stat to a five. Okay. All right, so presence. Engineering, submit. Uh, 2d20. Intimidation is a focus. Three successes. So yeah, you yell some obscenities at Yvette as you're you're plugging in the Heisenberg Compensator's rerouting power. And yeah, sure enough, uh, you are able to not only cow your raptor buddy, uh, but also uh, get the transporters on Gamma Section up and running again. I hope all of that was on an open comm line, too. Oh yeah, oh yeah, Captain heard all of it. <laughs> Actually, everyone on the bridge heard all of it. Go lay down, Yvette, I gotta do something! <laughs> All right, all right. I'm getting it done. I'm getting it done. I need, uh, I need, uh, uh, uh ten more minutes. We we can do this. All, all right. right. That's Gamma's section. What is Beta doing? Uh, can Beta move away from Surfer, sort of orbiting the planet slightly, while also attempting to transport more of the colonist stuff? You could do that. So uh, let's say you just proceed down, probably about to here. All right, and yeah, so uh, Lee, you're going to be doing another control engineering, and the beta will assist you with a sensors engineering. Again, difficulty of two overall. I will uh, buy an extra die using momentum mm -hmm. and applicable focus. Hey, there you go. That's a total of three, which means you get that momentum right back. Plus and the yeah. Ship. Oh, yeah, right. The ship has to roll still. rolling for the ship i think williams got it at least last i knew yeah um sure let me grab the beta section and uh i did look up neural interface it's anytime the ship suffers a breach the character suffers three challenge dice of stress thank you so much You're welcome. Mm. and there we go all right Hey, nice. two more successes. So a total of five successes, which means you get three momentum, which brings you to five, I believe. So yeah, Lee, you're having uh, no problems. You're just beaming everybody up. Nothing, nothing's going wrong. You're fine. <laughs> uh, but we go to <coughs> alpha section now. And my question is, uh, are you continuing with the Gestalt sort of attacks with the ice giant, quote unquote? Are you maneuvering differently? You know, what's what's the, the philosophy here? Because again... Is, is there a way to medically put people into a state that they do not uh, project anything mentally? We can you them could with gas them with gas. anesthesine. Because I want... Uh, so the commander looks towards the captain and says, if the minds of the people are feeding this, would it make sense to knock out those mines? Other than, um, I'll do you one better. Rather than tamper with the colonists, why don't we just lose? Lose the fight? Yeah. Make them believe that the fight's over. I could render that. You can definitely try. So, <laughs> Ela is just like, try. what the hell? Yeah, I'm trying to like think of how does this help you? <laughs> well, if like in my head, if the colonists see these giant, like the fight end, then that's the end of Ragnarok, right? 
Well, the only question I would have, Captain, is if they believe that the fight has ended, what's to prevent their belief from making the creature explode the planet? Also, for those who don't know Norse mythology, Sutir wasn't kidding about eating Fenrir. Like, in mythology, Sutir does eat the wolf Fenrir. So if you lose the fight, he's going to eat Alpha Section. I would recommend continuing our current course. but Okay, yeah, but we don't have, have the them decision. all here. We don't have them all here. So yes, how can we do that? We can, we can see just by gassing the ones that are here if it has an impact on his strength. And then we can send a message to the other ships if it does impact his strength to do the same in their cargo bays next round. Well, Alpha doesn't have any of the colonists because if you did do the beaming with the colonists, the Fenrir Alpha section wouldn't have shields. So it's only Gamma and Beta that are transporting people right now. Okay. Are, so could we, from Alpha, release gas on another ship? Yes, but it would take your action. And that's what I'm thinking. Okay, I like it. But how many have we transported so far? Got about 20%, 25%. Okay, um, let's do that. And we still have shields, so we'll see what happens. All right. So uh, I'm going to say, let's have Williams. Williams, let's have you roll four challenge die for me. Sure. Ooh, nice. Nice. Roll. Very nice. So uh, on beta section, we'll say, uh, Williams combined with Rast, you send an override command to the cargo bays to begin filling the cargo bays with anesthesizing gas, effectively knocking out the colonists. And you all do notice that Sutir does slow a little bit and the fires of, of both his being and of his sword die down a little bit. Um, however, he is still going to attack you on his turn and will still hit you, but because of six challenge die off of that, that means that his 12 die has now become six. Nice. So he's going to do a grand total of five damage, which Fenrir, uh, the alpha section, it's base of three. You have a blade of armor. That's five. So effectively just clangs against the armor of your ice giant and you're perfectly fine nice. but it yeah, is the call. player's turn again just keep beaming them up and knocking them out <laughs> hi welcome to the Fenrir <laughs> they're just beamed into a cargo bay that's already filled with gas <laughs> just imagining bodies like stacking up you like beam them up into the air and they just fall over and can you imagine the abject horror if for the split second while they're still conscious before they pass out? <laughs> also have fact? to have to lower the <laughs> lower the gravity in the cargo bays so that they don't hit with as much impact. Oh, I thought you were going to turn off gravity entirely. We were just going to have bodies floating just around floating in the cargo around. bay. <laughs> oh lord. <laughs> oh boy. So All right. Are we remotely activating Did we already remotely activate the anesthesine then? On beta, yes. On gamma, no. So you can do that for your action on gamma. You could anesthesine uh, your colonists. Well, uh, I think gamma should concentrate on just doing uh, beam the the beam-ups, and mm -hmm. alpha will remotely control gamma. Okay. All right. Uh, Z, ground, whatever. We're on round three. So, yeah, give me another control engineering assisted by the ship's sensors engineering. Difficulty of two. And, uh, transporter. Two successes. All right. Yeah. So, two successes overall. You beam up some more. And then as soon as they beam in, Alpha Section overrides the cargo bays and knocks them out completely. 
Uh, beta section. I now need you to do a control engineering, please. Difficulty of two. Okay. Um, as his hands are flying over the controls, trying to uh, target lock the people on, board the, on the planet, Lee looks at his console and he sees that the cargo base has just filled with anesthesine based on the command that has been sent from alpha section. He pauses in his work for a moment, slaps his comm badge. Captain, are you drugging the people in the car? What the hell is going on? It's it's harmless. It's not going to hurt them. If we don't do it, they might die. <laughs> well, tell that to all the concussions I'm going to be treating in about 20 minutes. Okay. I will happily tell that to them because they will be alive to hear it. <sighs> Commander Rest, do you concur with this course of action? You're muted. Yeah, John. It is the only way to lower the power of the creature that their consciousnesses are creating to begin with. All right. And Lee will return to his work and attempt to beam off more colonists. All right. That's two successes already. Can the Fenrir get you momentum? Let's see. Here we go. It can indeed. Two momentum. Very nice. So, uh, all that beam up happens, and since you are gassing your people, uh, let's have uh, let's have Dag roll this one. Dag, roll me a uh, six challenge die. Or how many did I have Williams do? Three challenge. Whatever Williams rolled. He rolled four. Four. That's what it is. Yeah. And we are also lowering the gravity to uh, lessen the impact of when they Blamed. Yeah, right. The, there, there's going to be some injuries, but it's not like grievous Yeah, we're injuries. trying to minimize any sort of collateral damage. Okay. So, uh, what I would say is you could spend momentum to reroll those zeros. There you go. I will do the same. Alright, so a total of four. So Sutir is only rolling two dice at this point. And yeah, sort of visually, Sutir's form, you know, before he was wreathed in flame, you know, fiery beard, flaming sword. Now it's like someone has taken a big bucket of water and sort of dampened the flames. Like they're sputtering. Uh, the sword isn't as uh, glistening with fiery might. And what happens is he comes in with his sword. Um, I'm not even going to roll because um, even if I get maximum damage, it's not going to hurt you. So the sword clatters against the ice giant projections uh, armor once again, and the sword literally shatters. And as Sutir sort of pulls the blade back and looks at it, uh, all of you notice that he is essentially, for lack of a better term, he is being thanos away. Like, he is literally dissolving as the psychic field that is, you know, keeping him manifested is more or less evaporated at this point. And I think at this point, we don't even need to do the fourth round because it's pretty clear that you guys have won the encounter. So what happens is you get the last of the colonists off the planet. Uh, Sutir sort of yells something in old, uh, old Nordic and disappears into nothingness. And at the same time, Lee, you notice that the sun has returned to normal. Lee to Commander Vassar, are your sensor readings suggesting that the sun is returned to its normal life cycle? Uh, yes, they are. I'm not even detecting a trace of any Tholian activity. I think we can assume that there was never any Tholian activity in the first place, although I do wonder who conjured that particular affectation in the myth. Um, can we scan stand down the, from red alert? Can we scan the um the planet for any kind of facility or outpost? Yeah, I was gonna say it looks like uh, Rash. Do you wanted to scan for uh, psychic concentration? Correct. Okay, let's do yours first because I think that's gonna answer uh, Archuleta slash Alel's question. Uh, I'm going to say let's do a insight command again. Difficulty of three because you're not on the planet. And you know what? We're just... nearing the end of the game today, so I'm going to spend three momentum. Okay. <laughs> Attaboy. 
and there four successes. Go. So again, remember before it was clamoring school children. Now mm-hmm. it's a very calm, singular voice, very serene, very uh, angelic, I guess would be a word for it. And uh, the voice is feminine now. And the voice says, thank you. I am able to exist as one being once again. And who are you? I have no name, or rather I have many names. But those names were given to me by the people you have taken from my surface. Do you wish them to remain off your surface? They can return in time. However, I need to... And this is me as the GM, not her pausing. This is me as the GM trying to figure out how to say this. You need to have a timeout. Yes, yes, something along those lines. I will pass your wishes along. Thank you. And he's, even though he doesn't have to say that part out loud, Mm -hmm. he's saying it out loud for the benefit of the captain and the people on the bridge. All right. Um, Should we prepare quarantine beacons for this system? Yes, Vassar. Thank you. Um, How are the colonists doing? We should make sure all the medical personnel uh, get down there to take care of any minor injuries that might have occurred. Speaking of minor injuries. I accept responsibility for anyone that's injured. May I also recommend a security detail for those who did not wish to leave so abruptly. That can be arranged. What were you saying, uh, Rast? I, I would completely agree. And uh, Tavi's like, all right, all right, get, uh, all right, Commander, let's go. Uh, Tavi holds up his phaser and starts walking toward the turbo lift. Hey, t- t- you need to take it easy with that thing. I've told you. We don't just wave phaser around at people. Hey, this, you know, the safety's on. Yeah, we'll talk I'm about it on the way. two thread. The <laughs> phaser goes off and hits the ceiling. Oh my gosh, again. Uh, he puts it away. <laughs> All right, point taken. <laughs> oh. Um, and yeah. The captain will kind of, uh, she'll go into her ready room once things have settled down and light some incense. Okay. And yeah. Uh, honestly, I think that's a, uh, a good way to end the session there. So yeah, good job guys. You, uh, basically navigated and you can ask, uh, James when he comes back, but, uh, yeah. So the whole premise to sort of give you a peek behind the screen, the whole premise is, uh, whatever your characters it, sort of worshiped or whatever your characters believed was going to happen. So the whole Ragnarok thing wasn't even a thing until James brought it up last session. Like before, it was just going to be, you know, oh, well, you know, there's some demons attacking the settlement. You got to deal with the demons. But I thought it was cool that because you guys brought up the thought of Ragnarok, I could take that and literally springboard off into what you dealt with today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's literally like the session. Mm-hmm. Like we just manifest it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. It was um. It was Jensen who was afraid of the Tholians. Yeah, I, I was sad we couldn't get Jensen it's, in there organically, but yeah. Did you uh, did you did you want to know what my uh, my explanation was going to be? Go for it. Um, he is subscribed to a basically a tabloid newsletter um, that flouts this conspiracy theory that all major problems since the formation of the Federation can be traced to time traveling Tholians. Nice. Nice. We're going to have to sneak that in some way because that's a discussion I want to have in character with someone. (laughs) Jensen, you're not allowed a Galaxy M31. Just letting you know. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, this is where I'm going to end the stream. So uh, Twitch YouTube, thank you guys so much for tuning in and you will see these people next week. Bye stream.